Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Juliet, welcome to the podcast. It's been a long time coming. It has been. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we have tried before, haven't we? And technology and global power failures and what else all got in the way. I don't know what happened last time, but I'm glad to have you on the show. So uh, you got a brand new book. It's called A Minute to Think. It's a fantastic book. Um, you talk about the price of busyness, something we're both mm-hmm. really passionate about. Um, what is the price of busyness? Let's talk about it in your own life and leadership, because for a lot mm-hmm. of us, it comes out of a pain point. That's where at your best comes from. It's like I burned out 15 years ago. Here's some things that will help you not do it. What was the price of busyness in your life? And was that something you struggled with and how? Yeah, we will talk about the work, but life is more important than work. So I always start mm-hmm. there if I have the liberty to the the fun thing about staying deep in this work for me is that I always identify so deeply with every story and every person because I'm if I was untended in my raw state, I'd be the busiest person you ever met because <laughs> I am just the workaholic uh, energizer bunny personality type, very frail to technology's addiction and lure. And so mm. I would be a person who just never stops moving. If I kind of didn't have my own purse in my my own book in my purse, <laughs> just <laughs> reminding me over and over and over. So that there there is a price that is constant. It's not really the I was lost and then I was found story. Right. It's it's the it's the daily reprieve. Mm. And the daily reprieve of busyness comes from first remembering that the price on my life is very big. And I was, for some reason, an image came to me this morning that I've never said on a podcast before, but I was lucky enough once to take a tour of the Palace of Versailles in France. Oh, wow. And it was, it's, it's just room after room after room of the most spectacular artwork and gold and statues that you've ever seen in your life. And, but it's Versailles. So it is really crowded. And there are a thousand tourists behind you pushing you through. And then in front of you, the guide is going, we're walking, we're walking, we're walking, we're walking. <laughs> and all you want to do is slow down for to, to just savor the visual pleasure and the awe and to stare at this level of beauty and you're not allowed to. And to me, that's what busyness does to me. It's just pulling me from the front and pushing me from behind. And I'm missing my life. I'm missing my children. I'm missing serendipity. I'm missing sensory experience in the day where a bird sings or I'm baking banana bread and I stand outside the oven and I smell it for a minute. I'm missing all of that because it's just we're walking, we're walking, we're walking. And that price, if I had to kind of double down on one reason or another that I do this work, I'm, I'm extremely passionate about how busyness at work costs us a lot, but it's the home piece, the life piece that we are so, you know, d- dedicated to change for people. And, and that's, that's what I see in it. I love that metaphor. Have not been to Versailles, but we did the turbo tour of the Louvre. And that is not the yeah. same as being able to, to see it. Right. That was... Uh, uh, a different story for another day. You also argue, and I think this is true in our culture, that busyness is a false god, Juliet, and mm. there is a hidden cost to it. What is the hidden cost of busyness in leadership? Uh, seven answers at once are Great. coming. So there's neurological cost. Our frontal lobes are too tired to do good work or be creative. We continually deplete them. We never replenish them. Enormous cost. There's the financial cost which we talk a lot about because we have a quantification process with our clients where we take all those busy touch points, the stupid email and the CCs and the unnecessary reports and the decks that nobody reads. And we actually put a dollar value to them. And we see that companies spend about a million dollars annually for every 50 people on unnecessary work. That's that's like the stepping on a Lego level pain cost that hopefully leaders 
leaders should just be sitting up right now going, uh-oh, I got to do I something I know you've got right seven. Now. Can you drill down on that a little bit? Because that sounds really important. Yeah. The So if you, let's say you hire a COO for your company right. and you hire Hannah, she's a superstar. You're going to put her to work. You're going to pay her $100,000 a year and you're going to pay her $100,000 a year whether scenario A, she wins an industry award, revolutionizes your business and makes the shareholders do the Macarena on the conference table or scenario B, she spends seven hours a day in stupid Zoom meetings playing hangman and then deleting CC emails for four hours a day. Whichever one you do, she gets $100,000 a year. So it's about this... It's the ratio of high value work to low value work that leaders need to take control of. And they can absolutely take control of it once they start realizing that busyness lures you into thinking that all of its touch points have value. If it didn't trick you in this way, it would have short tenure and it knows it would be kicked out. So it keeps making us think that all these things are valuable, but they're not. They don't add to top line. They don't add to bottom line. They don't add to people finding meaning in the daily tasks of work, and they cost a lot. Hmm. You couple others. You don't have to go through all seven, but you're you're already. I don't know if it's uh, liter- <laughs> I don't know if it's literally seven. Uh, I think that I love when we have a leadership audience because you can go yeah. into talking about legacy. And legacy is a passion of mine to think about, can you as a leader make the space? Can you quell busyness enough to go forward in the movie of your life to the moment when you're looking back on the legacy that you created? Can you design that with effort and purpose and intentionality instead of accidentally arriving there at your retirement party? And I think that leaders who quell busyness and make more space have the ability to write their legacy like a story they're writing with a pen. But without it, we have an enormous cost that we end up accidentally looking back on our track record because we didn't have time to design it. And I think maybe, of, I mean, yes, the financial one is the one that gets a lot of buzz in bigger corporations, but I think this is a big one for leaders. I think it is too. Does opportunity cost play into that at all? I'll give you a little uh, sample from my life a couple of weeks ago, we held off on all my 2022 calendar until the end of August. So end of August rolls mm-hmm. around. Instead of me and my assistant deciding this year, I pulled in uh, two of my top leaders in the company, my podcast manager and the one in charge of marketing and um, finance. And we just sat down mm-hmm. and we looked at everything thoughtfully, prayerfully. There were events I really wanted to do that I ended up mm-hmm. saying no to. And we had a really interesting conversation on opportunity cost, because if Mm. I'm flying from Orlando to LA to Dallas, you know, all in a week, those are really good events. I'm really excited for that. And yet that means that week is spoken for. I can't move the company forward. I'm responding to other people's invitations, not the priorities that perhaps are most important. It means I'm not home with my wife. It means all those things. What, to, to what extent does opportunity cost factor into our busyness when we think about the, the price? Enormously, enormously, yeah. because creative work, strategic work, meaningful work, high value work, it's all standing outside the door waiting for CC email to vacate some space. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's It's ridiculous. It's the things that make people wake up in the morning and want to have a job. Matthew Fox was um, a writer who wrote a book, The Meaning of Work, many, many years ago. And he said, people want work where they can serve others with their labor and dance their dance. Hmm. And if, if you want work to feel like that, filled with service and dancing, you have to get stuff out of the way to clear a platform for that work to step up. And that is, by the way, the only kind of work that excites the younger people, the Gen Zs and the millennials. They mm-hmm. want meaning and service. It's the only kind of work that differentiates you because it's where you have creative breakthroughs. So I think it's enormous. And honestly, between mm. you and me, I mean, I know we're both together in this mission of solving this and our books are so similar. And I think that uh, it just baffles me that leaders can still be tolerating this. It just baffles me that even after the exhaustion and the burnout and the COVID impact that 
there's some penny that still isn't dropping. Maybe you and I need to roll our sleeves up and, you know, double do some double time together. But yeah. what is it that is making that complacency sticky? And mm. why doesn't it just shift? It's it's uh, fascinating to me. Well, and as you're you're you've hinted at we're both speaking to ourselves. You're carrying your book in your purse. I'm carrying mine yeah. uh, with me because I know that I am very tempted to say yes still. And it is a, it is a constant battle. So what I love about your your book, and it's a, it's a concept that, that I think is so helpful. You talk a lot about white space. What is white space? Mm. White space uh, came as a name from looking at white spaces on an unscheduled paper calendar and realizing that when a day had white on it, literal white, that all sorts of magical possibilities were going to be found in the way that that day could unfold. Now, it has come to mean, it has different meanings in sales. It means untapped market share in, uh, there's a graphics design version, which is actually the white on the page. Hmm. We define white space as time with no assignment. It is any period of time that is at liberty for you to improvise with it. And it can be 30 seconds to take a breath. It can be an hour to plan your business. It can be anywhere in the middle. It can be a second and a half before you answer a question instead of just diving in. But those white spaces, the literal moments of unscheduled time when they're interlaced through the day, make everything different. And the foundational metaphor to really think about, I don't know if you're flipping to the beginning of the book, but it's really I am, the I'm building, looking for the diagrams. building a fire. Yeah. Oh, the diagrams. But we can going. show those too. The building a fire is really the foundational metaphor that helps people grasp this. So I'm a city girl. I grew up in Manhattan. So I know how to hail a cab and get good souvlaki, but I do not know outdoorsy things like building a fire. So I had to have someone teach me once, how do you build a good fire? And it turns out that ingredients are very important. You want to have all the right stuff. But if you pack all that stuff together in the wrong way, that no matter what you do with your beautiful wood and your dried pine needles, the fire will never ignite if you forget one critical ingredient. And that is the space. The space in between where the oxygen fuels all of that beautiful, it turns a spark into a blaze. And so we are the same. And this is the metaphor. We need that oxygenating room in between in order to do everything at work and at life better. You're so right. I was terrible at building fires too. I learned rather recently in my 50s, I'm embarrassed to say. And the key is log cabin, log cabin, Google it. It's the way to go. <laughs> but what that is, is exactly it. It is it is white space. It is space between the logs, space between the sticks, space between the kindling, so that it gets lots of airflow and oxygen in, and then you're off to the races. So for those of you watching on YouTube, this is really fascinating, page 2021. You can see a typical day with no breaks, right? You're going in 30-minute meeting to one-hour meeting to lunch, to this, to that. You barely have time to go to the bathroom. You barely have time to breathe. Mm. And we've all lived that life. I have lived that life in the past. I wouldn't recommend it. And you're recommending something with space, like these pauses between everything. Can you, un right. and that is something I adopted years ago where I would tell my assistant, I'm like, I cannot do back to back to back meetings. It's like, kill me now. Or if they're on the mm -hmm. calendar, I need to finish this one hour meeting at 50 minutes so I can get up, relax, think, grab a cup of <laughs> coffee or something, use the bathroom and even just sit there for a moment and process what is underneath right. that. What, what, what is that, that. And so many leaders don't do that. They're just, I stack my meetings and I'm busy all the time right. and I'm always going. Is that a sign of weakness? Oh, it's a sign of intelligence to do that. We have a very cardinal rule. We say never let the colors touch. So mm. on your meeting, if the colors are touching, you're in trouble. It means that you're going from one meeting, which you have not had time to process or take a note on or take your notes and put them into your your uh, you know note sheet or whatever you do. You haven't also had time to rest, recuperate, re replenish the frontal lobe, and you haven't had time to plan. You haven't had time to now turn your attention to the next meeting and say, who is this human being? What did they need last time? How did I do? What do they want? What kind of vibe do I need to get into to, to resonate with them? All those things, looking back, recuperation, and looking forward, can't happen if the colors are touching. 
So that is a foundational part of what we believe is necessary. And especially now, especially on Zoom, we'll keep coming back to this, that it's just not possible for human beings to keep going from, especially in a digital realm, meeting to meeting to meeting. I often do two podcast interviews on a Wednesday. Here we are on a Wednesday doing this podcast interview. I always book them with about a half hour minimum between episodes. Mm. And often if I can, I will take a 10 minute nap or at least lie down because I feel like that's a, that's a brain reset for me. Just had a wonderful conversation. Is there a minimum you said, you know, one second to breathe or two minutes to, you know, walk outside. If you were writing a prescription and you're Mm. the time management doctor, what would you say is a minimum pause between meetings? Between meetings specifically, I'd love to see 10 minutes. Mm. If I were writing a prescription, 15 is better. But if you're doing the 20, it's either going to be 20s or 50s. So you have to be realistic about it's either going to be probably 20 or 50. Probably it's going to be 25 or 50. Maybe you get 20, 45 if you're in a very evolved culture. But just start with not zero. (laughs) (laughs) You know, how about starting with anything other than you're literally pushing the notes away from the last meeting while scrambling to remember who even is the person who's already in your waiting room. Let's just start right. with that and then and then move up from there. What is the brain science under that? I know you've got some brain science in here, Juliet. What, what is happening in your mind when you're stacking stuff with no white space? Yes, The frontal lobe, which is sort of the brain's executive center, is becoming progressively more depleted. And the only known way to replenish, that's like the the C-suite of your body, the only way to give them more, give it more clarity again and make it work at full capacity is to give it a break. Hmm. It's the only way. And, and, and there is this shame around rest in our professional culture that I would really like to be the champion against. We hide around the corner like a smoker if we want to take a breath or close our eyes or reboot in any way. But it, we don't go to the gym and do 450 curls in a row without a rest. We do 15 reps and then we take a rest and then we do fi- because we know that our body needs that. And we just forget that our mind does. So when we give it that time, it replenishes. But then also amazing things happen. If you People are always asking me if the pause is empty time. Is it just, you know, nothingness? Yeah. It's never it's never nothingness. Because if you took an MRI scan of the brain during what appears to be a pause, you would actually see brightly colored active motion in the default neural network, in the places where memory and insight and creativity live, the brain needs time to cook things that we absolutely do not give it. And that's, of course, the classic example of I get ideas in the shower. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's super helpful to know. So this is not something like even if you're a super driven, high capacity executive that you can just power through. And even if you can do it, if you can do it day after day, year after year, your argument is you're missing out, right? That you're not tapping into your potential. Did I get that right? I'm sure that there are people out there who have some magical ability to just continue to drive without thought or rest and produce amazing things. I know that Mm. they exist, but I just don't think it's a good recommendation for anybody (laughs) who's not that particular unique superstar. All sorts of things happen when interlaced space is part of the day. Yes, we are more creative. We're more thoughtful. We're more strategic. We're more replenished. But how about we're also more connected as a team and we can notice each other and we're also kinder Mm. because when that selfish rough part of us comes out because stress is smushing around like you know it's finding its new place Mm -hmm. in our body it's because we're so depleted it's because we can't get back to that kinder center because we can't just feed ourselves first and there so there's so many there's the the big reasons and then the tiny reasons and then these beautiful sort of capillary reasons where it's just better. It's just better. Hmm. Um, It's not a big section, but you talk about negativity bias and what that does to the brain. Mm. Can you talk about how negativity bias impacts leaders? Yeah, that's a great question. The 
negativity bias is the tendency to look toward the negative. It's mm. this swooping where the mind focuses on the worst thing. That's the, you have six people on your Zoom call, you're presenting, six, four, five of them are going, this is great, and visually <laughs> nodding and smiling. There's one dude scowling and all you can see is him. And that's that's the negativity leaning. And if you don't have a gratitude practice or a celebration practice as part of your work, you're always going to be spending the day noticing the things that went wrong. Mm. It's your, it's a leader's job to be scanning for problems, mistakes, what can I fix? But you don't want to live there all the time. You want to have some containers. I have containers personally where in the morning I write three things I'm grateful for and three things that were a win in my business. And if mm. I don't have a way of putting those on paper, I'll just focus on the things that didn't go the way that I wanted. We also have a practice in our company and also became now a practice with my children called Ringing the Bell that I got from a wonderful author friend named Mike Robbins. And it's when you want to say something about yourself that's really braggy and feels un and somebody can unabashedly share something that is just tooting their own horn. And my children will come to me now and say, can I ring the bell? And uh -huh. say something about school or say something about friends because we've opened a doorway where celebration doesn't have to be, aw, shucks, I didn't deserve it. And where we can really r lean into the beauty of that. Uh, that's great. You know, I did some gratitude journaling a few years ago and you reminded me I probably need to get back to it. But you're right. Leaders can focus on the negative. So gratitude journaling is a really good way to get through it or even capturing a few things you're grateful for. Any other ideas? Because you're right. There can be... 30 five-star Google reviews for your church or organization and you find the one <laughs> one-star review. It's like, who are they? What's yeah. their email address? I got to blah, blah, right, blah. Right, right. What do you think about when you're falling asleep, it, right? It's not just that you find that review. It's you kind of rub on it. You sit with it and and think about it. And that's that negativity bias. I, I was just trying to remember for you where I heard this because one more popped in, but I'm going to I'm gonna be short on the source. I hmm. think it's Freakonomics. But it was a fascinating concept called headwind tailwind asymmetry. Have you ever heard this one? Mm, have not, no. Yeah, I loved this. You'll look it up. I'm pretty sure it's Freakonomics. But they talked about how we we have headwinds. We have things that are against us that we're always fighting. And we have tailwinds that are things that are pushing us forward and supporting us. And there's a natural bias in human beings to focus on the tailwinds, to have an asymmetry in our daily appreciation for the two together. So headwinds, very hmm. easy to see. It's a pandemic I can't sell. Uh, Delta is closing down our conference again. There's so many headwinds and headwinds personally too. I'm dealing with a health crisis. I'm not in the marriage that I want. Really, really tough ones. But we just don't give the same mental real estate to the tailwinds, to subtle things like I had parents that supported me or I went to a great college, mm. or a million people that I've forgotten have given me advice in my career that took me to where I am right now. We just don't tend to turn the the dial and t spend as much time with the tailwinds. And that's a beautiful meditation that I was playing with immediately when I heard about it is, what are my tailwinds? There's a lot of them. Mm. And it's just way easier to focus on the headwinds. Headwinds are mm. also actionable. They give us ideas of things to try to do to fix them so they get way more real estate. Tailwinds is just, is usually in the past and sometimes we don't know what to do with them. As a cyclist, that resonates a lot. I've had this blog ah. post I've never written, but headwinds okay. are, most cyclists would tell you they'd rather do a hill than a headwind. Headwinds are mm. really tough. But whenever I get a tailwind, first of all, your speed increases by 50%. But I just think huh. I'm a great cyclist then. I'm like, oh, look how awesome I am. It's like, no, you got a 30 kilometer an hour wind pushing you along. But, you you know, you take all the credit when you don't need it. You're reminding me that's the metaphor they used. Was, oh, really? Was oh, okay. Yes, yes. You'll have to listen. I think it's a Freakonomics podcast. Well, I'm a Freakonomics listener, so I'll have, to, I'll have to look up that episode. We'll list it in the show notes if we can find it, everyone. You also write about time thieves, Juliet. Yeah, I'll just mm -hmm. list a few drive excellence, information and activity. Um, drill down on a couple. And how do those thieves get in the way of our time? Sure. They're super important. So let me repeat them because they're tricky in the sense that they are actually all good things hmm. that overgrow and then steal our time. So if you gotcha. hear drive excellence, information and activity, you think what spectacular assets for any person or company. Of course, totally. we would want to have all those things. 
But when they overgrow, they have a risk. Drive becomes overdrive. Excellence becomes perfectionism. Mm. Information becomes information overload. And activity becomes just frenzy. And so we have to look at them. It's a, They're a little deep to go into all four. So let's pick one yeah, and pick then one. just walk it all the way through the process. So we'll take the thief of information. The thief of information occurs in our companies and in our personalities. It's that craving for more data, scoreboards, spreadsheets, numbers, research, Google tabs, right? And the thief of information costs us. My favorite story about it is from a guy named Steve Martin, not that Steve Martin, but Steve Mm. Martin, who was a data scientist at Microsoft. He's in the book. He had a very um, intimate knowledge with the thief of information. He was watching his team, really realizing that there was too much information, but he hadn't really done anything about it. And then someone from the marketing department came to him and said that they needed 22 pieces of collateral for the sales team. They needed decks, spreadsheets, PDFs, infographics. And he had this gut instinct that it was too much, but he didn't say it. He complied and he began to build these things. But in uh, in each one of them, he put a note and it wasn't in the footer or in a sneaky place where you had to really look. It was just in the middle. It said on page, I don't know, two or three of each thing. If you're actually reading this, email me and I'll send you a $50 Amazon gift card. <laughs> That's brilliant. So he put, of course, he puts out all the collateral material. Of course, nobody ever writes him for the money. And then the punchline is that when the team that ordered the materials came back to him the following year, they had an even longer list of stuff that they needed. And he was able to say, you don't need any of this because not only did nobody write in, <laughs> the team that asked for them when they were in their pre-production review, they also missed all of the links because they were skimming <laughs> and they didn't read it. And so- So that's a thief of information at its worst. It's tricking us in a million ways to do work that's unnecessary because more information always feels better. Now, each of the thieves has a correlating question that disarms it. And the question for information is, what do I truly need to know? What do I truly need to know? Truly, with the only italicized word in the entire section on the questions, truly, what do I truly need to know? And that can, of course, be applied for the we version for team. What do we truly need to know as a team and organization? Hmm. Yeah, and that leads to simplifying, right? We need to simplify Mm -hmm. our lives. And you're right, because you could build a dashboard that's so complicated, you can't read half the data and you don't even know what it means. On the other hand, if you could zero in on a couple of key metrics that would really help you keep your finger on the pulse, what are some keys in your mind to simplifying our overly complicated lives? Mm. One of them is a a phrase that was introduced to me years ago that means so much to me. It's just simply control or growth, pick one. Hmm. There's really only one that you can have with reliability over time. And so the more you abdicate control, the more you let go, the more growth you can have. Now, when I first heard this, I thought of it as growth as in top line. But I also realized that it means a lot of other things. It means my own personal growth as a leader. It means the growth of my team because they're properly empowered to take challenges and risks without me. So I love that phrase in terms of simplifying the other image that comes to me when you when you use the word is I have three teenage boys and the middle one has a very, very simple life that's easy for him because he has very few things. Hmm. And if you look at his desk, he has, uh, I just I was just walking by it, so I should have it memorized. There's a shark's tooth, a baseball cap, an iPad. I think that's it on the desk. My youngest is a stuff guy and he still hasn't figured out he is sitting daily in a pile of Legos, clicky pens, D&D character sheets. He's just, he's drowning and he's having a hard time. He's feeling emotionally uncentered and he doesn't know how to start sorting it. It's difficult for him. Sometimes it is just that simple that if we have less stuff and we can rewrite some of the rules of the additive nature of professional work, that we can get to a feeling of simplicity. So our mission is to teach people a reductive mindset, not reductive in some of the ways you might have heard the word, but in the mathematical sense as of, can you be constantly skimming work for what can you let go? What can you jettison? What can you reduce? What can you shrink in scope or delegate or hand off or kill entirely? This mindset 
is the most important pathway to simplification. And if people adopt it, they will then have space because they will have excavated it from underneath all the junk that's around them. You've got an email strategy, which I'm very excited about. Can you walk us through uh, how to get out of the nightmare of email? Well, it's a big nightmare. I know we're both fans of Cal Newport, who's talking mm-hmm. about not doing it at all. And and we we just just out of a curious uh, reveal, we as a team have been talking about doing a week with no internal email, just as an mm-hmm. experiment. Hmm. Just to see, because he, what he talks about, which I love so much, is that there are going to have to be these really creative thinking processes to potentially get out of yeah, an email yeah, life, yeah. and it's not a simple thing. So we're thinking of starting with a with a week, but we're not going to get there tomorrow. And Cal wouldn't say that we're going to get there tomorrow either. So we need some in the meantime strategies. And for me, it kind of boils down to two central ideas: we have to touch email less. And we have to compose email better. Hmm. Because touching it less means that it's less intrusive in the daily activities of our life. And composing it better means that when we actually get to it, when we do have to touch it, it'll be faster, easier, and more pleasant. How do you do that? And so that's how, do you, how I How do break you compose differently? Well, in, in the book, we go through some pretty detailed sections. We call it clarity, brevity, and punch. To give it a very skinny version, clarity is, is everything exactly clear in what you're saying? Are you using precise language? Brevity is shrinking, shrinking, shrinking the word count to be as tight as possible. And punch is visual. It is, can you use bolding, underlining, bullets, things to help busy skimmers? Because email, people don't read email, they skim email. So if you want to get busy skimmers, you have to visual stop sign, you know, stop signs and arrows pointing to the yeah. things that they should be paying attention to. One of the most important areas there is the subject line. That's probably the real estate that most people should start with. To have a subject line that pertains to what you are currently talking about sounds so simple, but it's it's not because people write one more thing because they were talking to somebody earlier and then nobody right. knows what that's about. Or, or they fail to put time sensitivity in the subject line. And this is a core practice that we teach is You must tell people when something is expected. Otherwise, they fall prey to this hallucinated urgency everywhere where everything is needs to be done immediately by end of day, not needed till Wednesday. Ah. Very, very important to put in the subject line when necessary. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's so important. We have actually banned email between staff members. You can only do email when there's external people. Now, we use Slack and Slack can easily be in-house email. So we have rules for Slack and then we try mm-hmm. to run most things through Asana and weekly meetings. But regardless of the, the, the method you adopt, I think you're right. You can die by email. You really can. Yeah. And, you know, I talked to Cal Newport about that. He actually does email. I've emailed him numerous times yeah. <laughs> and he'll respond. Right, yeah. It just doesn't govern his life. And, right. you know, he says if it's working properly, you're spending 15, 20 minutes a day on it. And we've got it down to about that level for external email, which I think is really good. And your um, reply schedule, definitely. I mean, it's such a great book. It's so practical, Juliet. Okay, a little bit of lightning round as we come into the home stretch here. Um, Not everyone's in the C-suite. You're like, great, Mm -hmm. you guys run your own companies. Good for you. You know, Carrie, you were the senior pastor. You get to call the shots. What about me? I'm in the middle. I'm at the bottom. How do you get Mm -hmm. white space when the culture around you is nuts? Mm -hmm. There was a graphic we didn't put in the book, and I wanted to put it in the book. And it was the 12 core principles that can change your life in the book. And then two columns. I can do by myself or I must have organizational buy-in to do this. Mm. And there were only 10, there were only 10 where I can do by myself and two where I need organizational buy-in. Wow. So it is incredibly important to remember that in your own span of control, dear, weary, exhausted, sweet, earnest leader who is just falling asleep at their desk while they're (laughs) listening to this, that you can all, you can write better subject lines. You can create breaks between the meetings that you call. You can take wedges and sips of white space of little moments of open time in between. You can become aware of your own thieves and begin to talk back to them. You can use simplification questions like the one example I gave you. There are so many things 
before you say, oh, the world is against me and the corporate mothership will never <laughs> let me have sanity. And it's a lot of that is true. But yeah. clean up, you know, clean up your own sidewalk first. And when you've swept with that little broom, the area right outside your shop, then write me and I'll tell you how to go. <laughs> I'll tell you how to go further. <laughs> That's such a good answer. Okay. What about the rest of your life, right? Like you're only spending 40 out of 168 hours at work, theoretically on average. Mm-hmm. How do you get white space in your life? Because people leave busy work and they go into their busy life. Yes. And they they bring it home on their shoes and, and then it's in our living room and then it's with our <laughs> children and it's just everywhere. So it was interesting. Guy Kawasaki is a person that I have always had sort of a fun sparring relationship. In the early days of my practice, he was the guy you described him earlier who said, I don't take white space. I just keep driving, 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 <sighs> driving. And But he's become a bit of a convert and had me on his podcast. But he didn't grasp one piece of it, which is if you make space... It does not stay empty. <clears throat> we're not aspiring to a meditation practice where we're looking for gap here. If you lift the log up of a burning fire, the flames immediately lick into that space that you've created. Mm. So when you make space at home, it's not sitting on a couch, two people in silence, just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, super awkward. It's that, it's that, or even when you're alone, it's that now you have liberty to improvise in the direction of beauty and meaning and you have time to stop in front of that golden framed picture and you have time to take it in. So if you have enough space in your personal life, you will end up moving into activities that I call white space adjacent. You'll watch the Cardinals. You'll take out your watercolors that have been in the back of the closet. You'll pick up fiction, mm, yummy fiction. Mm-hmm. We don't do enough fiction. And you'll maybe cook something that is not for dinner, but just for fun. And you'll get into these recreational grooves that elude you if busyness is too present. And you'll also be more present for the people that you love, that you see in your life. I, the, one of the greatest parenting tips I can ever give someone is something we've been doing for years and years is teach your children to say, I would like full attention. Hmm. Because in our busyness, we don't give it, we, we fake it. We're good at faking it. Hi, honey, I'm, I'm actually doing 17 things in my mind, but I'm staring at you like I'm really present, but I'm not. That cue of I would like full attention, you could teach adults to say it too, means you drop everything, no spatula in your hand, no AirPods in your ears, everything goes down and you turn your shoulders toward the person and you say hi. Mm. And oh my God, it feels so good because that that intimacy- I that crave maybe, that. You it's know, so rare. I, right? It's so I know. Rare. I mean, we just have two people living in this house now. We're empty nesters, but often my wife has her AirPods in and I have mine in. I'm like, okay, I got to pop these out and just be fully present. It's such a good- reminder. Anything else you'd like to share that we haven't covered? This has been super helpful. I think I might just double down on this concept of eradicating the shame of rest. I think Mm -hmm. that good leaders right now are often giving their teams a wellness day because they're so fried, but that is, it's good. It's well-intentioned. It's very important. It shows love, but it's also kind of like having a starving person and giving them a meal once a quarter and hoping that that sates them. Yeah. And I just want to say to everyone who does have control of, of a group, no matter how small, that rest must be laced into the daily experience. Mm. And it must be shame-free. I love that you said you take a nap. I wish I could do a whole book. On, well, there's a lot of books on it. But I like to talk about sleep. And I kind of mm-hmm. don't do it as much as I should because I'm, I'm, it doesn't really feel like my expertise, but when I was writing the book, I would write, 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 and then just fall asleep because I would spend so much. And then you wake up and you got that little window of post wake up time and you always get a great idea. So this shame of rest needs to go and the pride of self care needs to replace it. And I, maybe I'll just double down on that before we I love that. Self-care is not self-indulgence and that's what Mm. leaders have to remember. And, Mm. you know, I, I felt the stigma around naps probably about a decade ago. I started talking about them personally when I have an assistant, she started working with me maybe 14, 15 years ago. And I remember Uh, I've always been a napper because I get tired in the afternoon, late afternoon. Someone was coming up to see me. I had an upper floor office 
And it was like her first week on the job. And they're like, can I meet with Carrie? And she's like, oh, I'm sorry, he's taking a nap. And I said, listen, you can never say that again, okay? <laughs> like these people give to our church. You can't yeah. tell them I'm giving a nap. And then, you know, I just decided, you know what, enough with that. I'm not going to sleep when I have a meeting, but I'm just going to be public about it. So I would encourage any non-nappers to consider napping and just give throw in that. The book is fantastic. It's called A Minute to Think. It's a beautiful book, great endorsements from Seth Godin, Angela Ahrens, Daniel Pink, Cal Newport, Patrick Lencioni, and the subtitle is Reclaim Creativity, Conquer Busyness, and Do Your Best Work. Juliet, where can people um, find out more about you? Of course, the book's widely available now, um, but anything yes. you want to tell our readers, place they can go to to discover more? Yes, we, uh, we're at julietfunt.com. But even if you don't, I hope you buy it. But even if you don't, you can also go to the website and take the busyness test, which will awesome. tell you personally exactly where you are on the gradation of busyness. And we'll start to give you some tips and your results about how to reclaim creativity and find more time to think. That sounds fantastic. Juliet, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before. <laughs>